Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. As always, references to online resources mentioned in the episode will be available on the episode page at jimrutshow.com. I know you're all getting tired of hearing this, but if you like our show, please give us a five-star rating on your podcast app. Somewhat annoying, but it's a fact of the podcasting ecosystem that getting good ratings increases our visibility on the apps, which helps us build our audience, which lets us continue to get the great guests that we have on the show. So when you're done listening today, if you would, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. And if you have some friends you think might like the show, we'd appreciate a referral. Thanks. Today's guest is Jim Hackett. Jim's a really interesting guy. He spent 30 years at Steelcase, the office furniture company, before retiring as its longtime CEO. In 2013, he became a member of the board of directors of Ford Motor Company, being at least a transplant Michigander. That must have been quite a good thing to do, to be invited to be on the board of Ford. And then in 2016, he was actually hired by Ford as the CEO of a new subsidiary called Ford Smart Mobility which focused on the cutting edge of the future of transportation, things like ride sharing, self-driving cars, smart cities, smart infrastructure, all the interesting things we're going to talk about today. Must have done a pretty good job, or at least not screwed up too badly, because in 2017, Jim was named CEO of all of Ford Motor Company. He retired from that gig last fall. Welcome, Jim. Jim Rudd, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. Yeah, it's really great to have you. Jim and I met years ago. He was, his company, Steelcase, was a member of the Santa Fe Institute Business Network. And he was one of the few CEOs that actually showed up regularly. We often got, you know, heads of R&D or heads of strategy or random flunkies who people wanted to get rid of for a while. But, you know, there were two or three CEOs who would show up and Jim was one of the most regular. And I really enjoyed having conversations with him. And at first I said, you know, why would a furniture company want to be studying complexity science? And then we had a good shot conversation, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the show. As regular listeners know, I'm fascinated by the coming transition in personal transportation and in energy more generally. And we've had previous guests speak about topics like self-driving cars, battery technology, etc. In episode 94, we had Shaheen Farshi, who was the former GM autonomous car guy, at least a autonomous car guy. And now a VC who was an investor and board member of Zooks before it got acquired by Amazon. And in EP44, we had Steve Levine on where we did a deep dive into battery technology. So much of our conversation, though not all of it today, is likely to be on this transition from in the car industry, one of these you know, once in a hundred years kinds of transitions from where we are to where we're going. So let's start off by something I discovered while doing my research. I saw Jim give a video where he told a story about Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And I'd never heard this. I never had, never knew that Henry Ford worked for Thomas Edison and actually pitched him on the idea of cars. Could you, could you give us a little color on that? You bet, Jim. And as I lead into this, I just want the audience to know that the Santa Fe Uh, investment personally was the single most valuable bit of time I ever spent. And it's the gift that keeps on giving, which I hope to share as we describe this. But in that, in the history of uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, Henry Ford is an engineer that works in Thomas Edison's electric plant. And they create the first, listen to this, electric vehicle. Um, so the first vehicle that Henry Ford invents is electric, not not gas or what we call the internal combustion engine. And uh, the reason uh, it doesn't uh, hold as the, you know, the track they want to develop is because the power output coming from the battery is just not sufficient enough as compared to the, what, you know, gasoline or petrol would, would generate. And the cost was too high you know, to try and to, to get it up higher. I mean, can you imagine, Jim, the mass of what they'd have to create to generate the kind of power to push a vehicle back in those days given? But I love telling that story because at his core, with all of his foibles and gifts, 
Henry was an environmentalist. Um, you know, he was a staunch believer in nutrition. The Battle, the Battle Creek uh, cereal manufacturers were his best friends, and and he owned lots of land and he was an outdoorsman. And so I think he probably, you know, if he could come back and live his life again, he would have rather had an electric vehicle as the basis for his invention. Cool. And yeah, most people today don't realize that, say, around 1908, 1910. It wasn't entirely obvious that internal combustion was going to win. There were electric cars. The fact at one point, the number one motion producer was steam. You know, the Stanley Steamer, I believe, was the largest selling car in America at least one year. So this foray into internal combustion was one of three possible forks that the world could have taken. And growing up in central Ohio, uh, my dad was a veterinarian and, and we were in the center of farmland there was always a steam tractor show every summer because they, they dominated the market uh, as well. And in fact, Jim, I had a, a trivia question. I could never really get my finger totally on this, but when I came in as the CEO of Ford and we were talking about the future of mobility when there was a lot of players, I said to everybody, so how many winners do you think there will be? And rhetorically, I, I said, how many car companies do you think Henry Ford competed against? at the beginning. I'll let you think about that. I can tell you the number I found. What do you- I know the number, I think. This is one of these odd things I happen to know. I believe it was like three or 400. That's it, it's it. And you know, I say it's north of 250, so we, we would agree. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And so one makes it, one really, two, there was, you know, the Germans, Daimler was progressing, but it's not, it's not 10. You know, and, and that's kind of the thing about core technology is a lot of people on the edge, but there's few winners. Yep. So of course, the same is true in China today. I think I heard there's 600 companies that at least claim to be working on electric cars in China. And we know that there'll be maybe three winners maybe over there, something like that. So it is one of these very interesting times. It's just like I also like to point out to people when I was heavily involved with PCs in their early days. There were 30 legitimate contenders for word processors in 1985, right? And how many there are now? One, basically. You know you're in a fruitful era when there are so many. And you also know kind of somewhat sadly that most of them aren't going to make it. And, and, and the underpinnings of Santa Fe are alive here because that's the notion of emergence, right? There's a number of variables at work here. And, and the most fit model is going to emerge or models uh, but that's the reason that you don't get high numbers. It's because the other ones really aren't fit enough to survive. Yeah. In fact, Brian Arthur at San Fancin, who will be on the show in June, actually, has done a tremendous amount of work on that in modern industries in particular, there's positive returns to scale. If you remember our microeconomics, the assumption was somehow the cost went up per unit as the unit did. And so the supply curve had that shape to it. Demand curve had this shape, blah, blah. Well, it turns out in modern industries, that's generally not the case. Actually, the unit cost goes down with scale. Transparency reduces friction, particularly for the big boys. And, you know, just think how rapidly we went with Amazon from being, you know, Jeff Bezos in his garage with a pile of books and CDs to one of the biggest companies in the world in less than 30 years. And I can recall that he was not even the best financed of the first bunch. There were several that were much better financed, pissed their money away. And Jeff was just smarter and more persistent. And then the network effects kicked in, crushed everybody. Yeah. And, and, you know, Jeff West's book that I recommend that I know you, you know what I'm going to say about scale, the underpinnings of that became a Bible for me that I made everyone on the management team read. And, and just randomly, the day that I had asked them to read it, I had Satya Nadella from Microsoft at a conference speaking to my senior team at Ford. And he says, I may learn it all, not a know-it-all, Jim. And I, I saw a book in your office, Jeff West's book. And I go, oh, yeah, I just, you know, there's, there's three or 400 people in the room, but my top team, you know, is 15. I said, I just made an assignment. I didn't do this a lot, but they need to read that book. And his comments that followed were so wonderful because he went on about what he's learned from that. And one of the principles are that as you get bigger, you have to get, you have to get the unit cost advantage. But if you've seen for the listeners, there's a TED talk that Jeff did where he explains, though, eventually you can't get the extensibility of the cost advantage 
in business. So in other words, Amazon at some point runs out of that, that cost advantage. And it, so its fitness starts to get challenged. Yep. Hadn't happened yet, though, but it will. Well, no, and, and, you know, look, there's a lot of jobs and a lot of wealth and a lot of gain for everybody while it's growing. But the, the recognition, uh, I never lost this, Jim, in, in leading businesses, the recognition that fitness is fleeting always caused me to pay more attention to it because of Santa Fe. And, and we can talk about, you know, how that manifested itself. My very first application of complexity thinking to business, which was when I was at Thomson Reuters as the CTO and sort of de facto strategy guy, we did a lot of acquisitions there. It was sort of a holding company, not exactly. We had six different sectors that we were in. We bought and sold companies, but we also grew companies internally. I pointed out that just as you said, that the business ecosystem is really a co-evolutionary fitness landscape that hills are going up, hills are going down, ridges grow off of hills. And unfortunately, it's the nature of bureaucracy to march straight up the hill that you're currently happen to be on and entrench at the top. If you get there, maybe you only get halfway up. As far as you get, you entrench and you pay no attention to whether your hill is going up or going down. And you need to open up your lens much more broadly to think about what it is that you're really in. You know, the, you know, the famous stories of the railroads not realizing that they were really in the transportation business and none of them became significant players in the trucking business, for instance. I don't believe any of the buggy manufacturers ended up being major car companies. If you had redefined you know, your business as transportation or mobility, you might have made the move and to be a player in this world instead of it being you know, 50 year generations. Now we're talking about five year generations. So you certainly have to have that vision of business if you're going to be successful today. Well, and I learned this from a technique that I can't remember who I borrowed it from. I should, because it's one thing I would pass on to our listeners is you start when you're examining the decline. Let's let's keep it where you and I are, the decline of a business that was historically successful. Let's pick Kodak. Um, You have to start with the phrase, they weren't idiots. You know, I knew a board member, Ernie Davenport, one of my friends, extraordinary guy. He was in the boardroom when they had the digital patent. And he said to me, Jim, the cost was too high. So they, you know, they had really smart people. What I learned from Santa Fe, that they learned from studying natural systems and natural evolution, the Darwinian forces, is the incumbent system isn't willing to give up the virtues that made it great. So I then coined this phrase. I don't mean to suggest it's it's Santa Fe worthy, but I coined it in business saying there's a perversity law then, which is you choose to die rather than change. And and so that's what happens in in the Kodak story. They they make so much money in chemicals and paper and digital has no margin and is too expensive. It's an easy decision to stay with chemicals and paper. So, So Jim at Ford, I would cause these thought experiments and I'd say, okay, since they weren't idiots and you can't have the benefit of hindsight, what should we have done differently if we were running that company? And I came up with this idea with them, which is we should have been measuring the number of photographs that people have in their home because we knew between Fuji and Kodak that they dominant market share. And we could have then derived, but they have more photos in their home on their person then the, then the film would explain, which meant that it was coming from digital sources. And that was their business, was building, like you said, transportation. Their business was delivering photographs. And so we translated that into a Ford opportunity, which is we're going to lose track of the digital exhaust coming from our vehicles that are going to other people. And, and therefore, we can't give up our future because people are monetizing digital information coming from our vehicles. And so, uh, but Santa Fe deserves the endorsement of helping me understand why there weren't idiots that missed trends. It's because there's an incentive, you know, a perverse incentive uh, because all the value that you'd have to give up or the virtue that you have to give up of the incumbent system. I'm one who's generally pretty skeptical about business books. Most of them are kind of intellectually lightweight and often self-serving to build the consulting career of the authors. But there's one that of the five or six really good business books that I'm aware of 
called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. And he makes this point in a very formal way. And you and I both have run publicly traded companies. We know how this can be if the CEO doesn't help overcome it, which is the people that are involved in the business lines that are making today's profits have inordinate control of next year's budget. And the last thing they want is to see profit from their business line, which actually reduced the profit in some sense, going to this upstart who's trying to do what? Cannibalize our own business. And this is the fatal flaw of the big bureaucratic climb to the top of the mountain and entrench model is that you don't allow yourself to cannibalize yourself. Because as we used to say at Thompson Corporation, now Thompson Reuters, hey, if we don't do it, somebody else is, right? Way better to cannibalize yourself than to let somebody else do it. Well, and God bless Clayton, because, you know, he just passed away. But I was fond of saying that he was a physicist who became a business professor because of all the people I met in the Santa Fe world. Another another thing that I'll pass on because you used it. That's so fun to talk to you because you're 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 resonating with me very directly. As I said, imagine that we're in a boardroom of the Pony Express and we go, hey, I got a great idea. Let's get rid of the pony. And, you know, how long would that CEO have stayed in that boardroom? You know, but that's what had to happen in the fitness landscape question. And the virtue of the pony had served as long as it could. So that's another lesson because I'm 66 this week and I get to say to myself, I don't have to worry about that in boardrooms anymore. I hit the point where I had done it for almost 30 years. But I do like to, not to teach in universities, but I like to help younger CEOs see what you, Jim, and I and Santa Fe have discovered about natural systems. Because if they're provincial and they're thinking and they go, well, this doesn't apply to business, but it's everywhere else in the design of things, then we're in trouble, right? Because you're going to lose to the gravity of that science. It's, it's going to catch you. Very well said. And, you know, you know, I've also retired from the game directly. You're a baby, hell, I'll be 68 this year. But what I do do as part of my public service is mentor young CEOs. And I have a little CEO advisory thing that I do. Uh, and I basically take them through about a year. And then if they graduate, then I say, here's my email address. Email me any questions you have. And uh, I have, you know, tried to help instill almost exactly that kind of perspective. All right, let's hop into a little bit more of the meat of particularly the goings on at Ford. But before we do, I want to ask you, when you were growing up, were you a car guy? Did you like cars? Uh, you know, this hurts me in the car press. I was not. And mostly not because money and car guys had to be tied together. In fact, the shade tree mechanics, you know, emerged because they can't afford the service. And that makes people really ingenious about taking cars apart. But no, I, it, it didn't translate in my in my family uh, because of the rural uh, scarcity. I mean, we, we didn't live in the middle of nowhere, but the town was very small and my, my life was around animals and, you know, my dad's medicine. My mother was an artist, by the way, and three older brothers. So it was more sports. You know, we were we were, we were really tied into that. Uh, but I want to tell you something. I have a healthy respect for the car guys. In fact, the guy that succeeded me at Ford intentionally is a car guy and Jim Farley, because it, you do need that instincts in this in this business. And I hope to in, that I imparted on him the things that you and I are talking about, and particularly around the influence of technology. That's kind of why I was asked to step in. Cool. Now let's move on. One of the momentous things that happened on your watch was in 2018, Ford announced it was going to eventually discontinue, not even eventually, relatively soon, most of its passenger car lineup. I mean, some well-known brands like Taurus, which for a long while was the best-selling car in America, Fusion, which I always thought was the, probably the best American middle-of-the-road car, and the Fiesta, which is, was a neat little car. Tell us about how you came to that decision and what drove it. Well, the underpinnings, just to keep the constancy of influence here, uh, was the fitness question. The virtue of vehicles that, that you hear me referencing in nature, the virtue of the older system, the virtue of vehicles starts to shift. Uh, and, and I can't date it specifically, but let's just say when sport utilities start to raise the height 
for drivers. So they actually are, have a better perspective in the road. And then you have all this utility. You can, you can have four wheel drive because at the time the transmission structures were larger and you can have storage. The, the negative, Jim, was, and, and I thought deeply about this, is that when somebody in a job like mine 15 years ago might have had the same instinct, that, that the vehicle, what I call the silhouette, the outline that surrounded the driver, they had a preference for the cabin size to be bigger and higher. If they had an instinct as a CEO to run there, then all of a sudden you'd have like a, an oil crisis and the price of fuel would go up and the penalty to the, to the owner was so uh, hard that they, they suddenly, and I, I'm young enough to remember uh, when people got rid of all their trucks and SUVs and all bought smaller cars during an oil crisis. But here's the new in information, as we touched on it earlier. There's no penalty in the future for the silhouette size because of electrification. So my, my team and I reasoned that we ought to get on that path faster than, than later because we know the electrification is coming and we can start to give customers through better gas engine technology and hybrids we can give them the environmental advance that they need right now. If the price of oil went up really fast, we have enough in our product line before it's all electrified to give them that's the, hot, the bigger silhouette and not to have a penalty for fuel. That's pretty deep thinking, realizing that, okay, you have current demand looking for SUVs, but you have this interesting heads that we're going to electric anyway, so we don't have the downside. I like that. Two-step thinking, right? Relatively rare in American business, I hate to admit. That was a good play. I like that. And, you know, the whining part of it is two CEOs that I would like, our folks are listening in to us. Wall Street didn't really like it. And the reason is they, they wrote the line, remember I said a minute ago, how would this go over in the boardroom? The Pony Express CEO says, I'm going to get rid of the Pony. How's it go over in the Henry Ford Motor Company? I'm going to get rid of the Taurus, you know, and it, it so people thought it was just a disingenuous kind of swing, but it's turned out, I'm really proud of this. You said it was 18, 2018. Here we are in 2021. Virtually all the other manufacturers followed suit. Uh, General Motors and others started to get rid of their of, of some of their cars. And, and it's the same reason, right? It's the same issue. It doesn't mean to suggest that we'll have smaller silhouettes in the future, but if they're uneconomical to the car companies, you know, they can't make them. Uh, uh, and I, I actually have a theory how that will evolve. I think they will get smaller with the intelligence of the vehicle, but, but for now, you, the, the, that's a bridge too far. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And one of the bits of research I did for this episode, I usually end up doing about 10 hours of research for episodes that I actually know at least a little bit about what I'm talking about. I wanted to check where the various car companies were on their dedication to the electric road ahead. And it looks to me that Volvo, GM, and VW of the Western companies have committed firmly to all electric at some point in the future. Well, Ford is not yet fully there. They say that the majority of their cars will be electric, but they still are hedging a little bit on that. What's your view? Do you think that we'll be in an all electric new vehicle environment sometime in the foreseeable future? Well, I'm, I'm not dodging it, and but I want to I want to help you rephrase it. First of all, and I worked hard at this again. I'm a theme here. Wall Street didn't like this, but I'm, I think I'm proving to be accurate with this. The first thing you got to think about is propulsion. And, and listening to your podcast, this fits your instincts, is the notion of moving something and calling it electric as like it's the dominant design forever is probably not fair because hydrogen has promise as well, right? And there's even, there's even other ways uh, from one gentleman that you interviewed on the podcast where you talked about the nature of how energy was being produced by a wood and heat finds its way, you know, in the influence of the evolution of industry. I want to uh, assert that in the automotive industry, as we know, it, or vehicle business, it's the same kind of thing that energy will constantly be long in the tooth in terms of platforms, but it'll continue to evolve because the payback is so high. So that's the first thing. So what we reasoned and my successor and I really worked closely on this, I came in and it was kind of a, a nil or zero investment in electric. 
I raised it to 11 billion. And my successor in the in the last six months has doubled it to 22 billion. So substantially, the company's making a huge commitment. The reason it's not all is because the work requirement that we know from the F series buyers. So we're the largest producers of trucks in the world and commercial vehicles. The cost benefit ratio, and this isn't a this isn't a climate tax either for fuel, for gasoline, uh, is still much higher in these real heavy duty kind of applications. When you said, what do I predict here? Here's what I predict. As the vehicle intelligence grows, the weight of its protection drops because it can't crash. It's so smart. And therefore, the alternative forms of energy now let the substitution be fully realized. But I, I don't want to try and put a date on when those intersect. But I do think that, you know, Ford's contribution to environmental uh, climate change, we were the first to come out. I'm, I'm saying this with great sincerity and say we don't believe the Paris Accord should have been abandoned. And Bill Ford and I wrote a piece on Medium that said we're committed to it, even with the standards, EPA standards being relaxed, we stayed on the curve that are more stringent. And that's what's motivating now the president of the United States and the rest of the governments to to rebirth, you know, more stringent standards. So Europe will lead in this regard, both China and the U.S. I think China will put more resource to it, but the U.S. will be ahead of them. And so when you ask that question, we should be thinking about there's three platforms around the world that all will won't all synchronize at the same time. So that all let the people. Very good and nuanced answer. In another area that we talk about in the show a fair amount is climate change and the road ahead. And I continue to be a believer, even though nobody else in politics seems to agree with it, that a carbon tax, particularly one that's 100% refundable per capita, would be a great forcing function. You know, if we say started at the equivalent of $50 a ton carbon and just stipulate over the next 20 years, it's rising to $200 a ton carbon, that would be such an interesting signal because it doesn't tell you, you as Mr. Ford, what to do, but it tells you the ecosystem that you're involved in so that your brilliant people can figure out, you know, figuring out how to make an electric F-250 the right thing to do might not be feasible. Maybe it's methanol, maybe it's hydrogen, but at least puts a gigantic economic vector towards getting away from CO2. And I think that's one of the biggest imponderables is Will we actually get serious about climate change, in which case the the move towards at least non-petroleum-based transportation could well inflect upward, but we don't know when that will occur. Well, and here's another positive influence to be uh, my dad. I I talked to him a few times today about him. He was an eternal optimist, and I've inherited this. So when I came and gave the talk at CES when I was a brand new CEO, I talked about you, you, you actually pollute more when you're in traffic than when you're moving. And so, and you're in traffic more than you are moving. So the hardest problem right now is to get the traffic snarls undone, which gets to the intelligence of the vehicles. And, and so as we architect smarter vehicles, which means we can have more choreographed traffic, we will have reduced pollution, uh, irrespective of the propulsion. But because the propulsion is changing underneath that and the intelligence is growing in parallel, this is a a much better world, Jim, uh, because the capability of the vehicle to not pollute. So here, even with hybrids, here's an example. The Germans did a study. So draw uh, circles emanating from the center of Paris out. And at a point uh, with a hybrid, the vehicle can be running on its battery. It gets outside of the density of the population, which changes the nature of the way, you know, the CO2 is being processed and and it and it and it can charge itself with the gasoline engine to get back to a logistics depot outside the circle. It's smart enough to know when it's left. In fact, the sensing such that it could know the air quality such that it 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 only got permission to turn the engine on when it knew the air quality was high enough. Um, and not making it worse. These, the intelligence is probably as promising as the electric engine. That, that's all I want to get across um, and need lots of invention there, but I think it's really promising. 
Yeah, we'll talk later about an article that you pointed to, actually, or your assistant did on smart infrastructure. Well, we'll talk about it when I get there. I don't want to steal the thunder yet. Now, let's you know focus a bit still on electric cars because so now Ford is committed to a majority of its vehicles being electric and GM and VW and some others, all of them at some point in the not too distant future. Going back to our Santa Fe perspectives, one of the things we know that has to happen, and, and you know, I'd love to get your perspective on where you think this is today and how this is going to be managed in the future, is kind of the co-evolution of the charging infrastructure and even eventually the electrical generation capacity to be able to effectively charge this large fleet of electric cars. That's super insightful on your part because if you're a systems thinker and you realize if you, you know, if we don't make the equilibrium of charging meet the demand, we're, we're going to have a big problem. So I, I want you to know, I think there's zero uh, blindness on the part of all the car manufacturers, how important this is to follow. But here was the, here's the hard problem is the penetration, for example, in the U.S. today of the electric vehicles was less than 5%. So, so if somebody, a business person, invested in infrastructure, you remember when Paul Allen you know, was buying a lot of the fiber optics and, and coax cable, he was ahead of his time, but Vulcan didn't get a return on that because the demand for that, he was totally right about it. I think he was glad he had it in the end. And, and because he was infinitely wealthy, he could hold that long arc So this is one of the questions. I spoke at one of the big energy consortiums in my last pre-pandemic thing last year in Phoenix. And it was, it was all the heads of all the energy companies, uh, you know, utilities and what have you. And this is the number one question they were asking is we want to be ready, Jim, for charging, but when will you be ready with the demand? You know, so it's a circular equation. So here's what's happened, Jim, is when we launched the Mustang, what we ended up doing is we tell our buyers that we're going to create a network uh, through alliances of charging businesses so that you can like have one code or one number and wherever you go, you don't have to be beholden to, you know, if you're a Tesla, you had to find a Tesla charging. And so that's what happened in computing, you know, is the USB standard helped all the computer people lower the cost of charging. And so we were, we're a big advocate for that in, in the world that you're talking about. But, but I haven't answered your question when the tipping point is such that there's zero risk that you won't have it near you. I, I can assert this because I have lots of people ask me this. If you were going to take off from a major city to a major city, you're not going to have a problem uh, meeting the requirements during your trip. You're going to have to stop somewhere and charge, that's true. But the ranges are up to 300 miles. And you know, the average person travels less than 35 miles a day. So that range anxiety is only on longer trips and therefore you have to plan. If you're in the middle like I was in this little town in Ohio, there's just not gonna be the incentive for the networks to be built out ahead of the demand. But that's that's not 100 years away. I mean, we're talking within the next decade and here's why. Something happened in the last two years is Amazon decided to make all of its delivery vehicles electric in time, both with Ford vehicles and Rivian, which we are invested in. They bought a part of Rivian. And, and so they, they have, you know, I don't, I, I probably shouldn't release how many vehicles they have in their fleet, but let's just say it's going to pull along the charging infrastructure because how big they are. Well, that's good news. As I said, I did some research for this show. I learned a bunch of interesting things. Of course, you know, the presence of a charging station is one part, but then the second part is how long does it take? And what I learned is there's really two kinds today of charging stations, so-called DC fast charge, which can charge a car in under an hour. And then there's the level two AC chargers, which can take up to 12 hours to charge a car. And again, if you are doing your you know, 15 mile commute to work and you charge it at home and you live in a private residence where you can have your own charger, the fact that it takes 12 hours, not much of a deal. On the other hand, if you're driving cross country, because you, you, know, you mentioned 300 miles on a good day with the wind, if it's mostly downhill, my wife and I love to do road trips. One of our hobbies is get in the car and drive, you know, drive from Virginia to Austin, Texas and listen to country music for two weeks, right? We're heavy footed. We'll drive 650 miles a day, right? And uh, that's not going to work too good. 
truthfully, if we could find a place halfway on the day, have lunch and do a one hour charge, that might work. But, you know, for, at least for some missions, it's going to be tricky. And there's a couple of ways to think about this, Jim. And I, again, with your background, this won't elude you, but to the world that aren't electrical engineers, they think of a vessel like a, like a gas can and you, and you put that nozzle in the vessel and you fill it to the top. When you're charging a battery, it's not like that because we're dealing with electrons. And, and so it, they, you can get a full charge, but to the extent you speed it up, they don't like that. The electrons don't like that. So that reduces the capacity the next time you charge it. You've actually, it's like stretching the can too far. If, if I could, I'm, I hope the, uh, the electrical engineers aren't laughing, but I do want the world to understand that it's not because it isn't important. It's because it's physics. And here's what the way to be optimistic. Elon's caused a lot of this, but Ford has an extraordinary team in the battery world. I mean, extraordinary. And I learned from them and University of Michigan, which happens to be right next to us, has one of the leading uh, academic departments around this for obvious reasons is when you put the batteries together, their proximity and the origami of packing is what also changes the risk because of the heat that comes off the battery. So the septums that are separating them are an area of innovation. I don't know if I should use the word invention listening to you guys the other day, but, but, but that is a dynamic problem. How much you can put into the battery, how closely packed they can be, what's the septum material. And it's just getting better and better. That's how it used to be only 60 miles. Now it's 300. Is it on its way to 500? Yes. There's a new technology called digital batteries. Um, and it's still chemistry and physics together, but it's reducing the heat problem. And that has promised by 2025. Uh, the world, uh, Toyota and the Japanese government have really spearheaded a lot of this. But Ford's been invested in this idea as well. And uh, VW, as you just referenced, is, is because because of Europe, they they have to make this shift. And they had a little nudge. I'm not picking on them, but with the diesel uh, crisis, they had to come to the conclusion that the future of their vehicles had to be around a propulsion system that gave their their drivers and users the kind of mileage and efficiency that they promised with diesel. And we found out that wasn't true. Uh, and it was really uh, debilitating to them, but they've recovered nicely. And I think they've turned all their attention now. They had to pay a penalty to your point in the United States. Part of the settlement for that was they had to build out part of the charging network. Uh, they helped, had to help fund that. So, uh, so these are all forces at work, I think, to make it more optimistic, not negative. Yeah. Those are the things that, you know, American free enterprise has historically been pretty good at, right? Because we, people pays their money and they take their chance. And there's always somebody who's willing to take a little bit more risk for a little bit higher return. But as we talk about network systems here, we alluded to it in passing, which is the aggregate amount of electricity available to do the charging. Today, it's small enough. It doesn't really matter. Maybe it does in Southern California where there's lots of Teslas, but most places it's a small percentage. But if half the cars or more were electric, the demand on generating capacity could be substantial. But the grid is something I've studied a lot, and it's a Santa Fe Institute specialty, actually. And electricity is a weird product. Its economics depend on all kinds of things, very substantially time of day. You know, there are many places in the United States where they have big generating capacity, say on the Columbia River or in the state of Maine, which has several nuclear plants, where you can buy electric power for half a cent per kilowatt hour between midnight and 4 a.m. And if we had differential time of day pricing and smart chargers and things of that ilk, we could squeeze a lot more cars being charged with no more generating capacity. And we learned from Texas, don't we, Jim? You have to tell me, but they didn't have interconnectivity. I don't think they were able to to flow from a part of the world that had the excess down to Texas. Is that fair? That is correct. It's an oddity. The U.S. basically has three grids. It has the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, and the Texas Interconnect. And the other two are big enough that the statistics of failure are such that if one part goes down, the other one can usually help it. But Texas, for odd political reasons, that basically didn't want to be regulated by the predecessor to FERC, 
basically have an in-Texas grid only with inadequate, very, very thin interconnects to the rest of the country. So when they got in trouble, they were in deep trouble. If I were the dictator of the world, not a bad idea, I must say, I would certainly use some of this infrastructure stimulus money to strengthen our interconnects across the grid, both in the east-west and into Texas. And I'd also invest ahead of the curve, because the government can afford to do it, to build high-voltage DC to be able to bring things like wind power down from the Dakotas. You know, the Dakotas are the Saudi Arabia of wind power, but there's very thin utility lines out that way. And, you know, that's the kind of a good thing a government could do to spur investment by private parties is to build the interstate highway system for electricity that would help us all. And wind is actually very good for this nighttime charging because wind is actually anti-correlated with load, which makes it less valuable for normal uses than solar, which is positively correlated with load because... Wind blows stronger at night. Well, guess what? Solar doesn't work at all at night. So you really want to have a balanced portfolio of wind and solar and nuclear and hydro, et cetera, you know, for our carbon future. And understanding when this transition in cars happens and how smart we can get about how and when we charge will actually be important to the people designing the grid of the future. Well, and gosh, that was wonderful. You should come and speak at Ford and, and, and places like this, too. I mean, we have lots of smart people, but the whole company to understand what you just described, I think would be really helpful. Because here's the thing, what you, you, you're you asking the question, will we, in the systems design, will we end up with, you know, a seesaw with one end much heavier than the other? And that's potentially fatal if, if we do, because if people can't recover from an emergency or they they can't, you know, get somewhere they have to get. Uh, it will, it'll be the death of, of, of a better uh, environmentally enabled uh, propulsion. So, what, I, what I've been a, a proponent of is that we do the long arc kind of spending with the government. This is where they're great partners, right? So Harry, Harry Truman was it or Eisenhower? I think it was Truman that built Eisenhower did the interstate highway system. Eisenhower did the interstate highway. By the way, this is one of those trivia things. You know, the original, I think, was a defense strategy so they could move the missiles. Yeah, well, uh, there's all kinds of stories. One, they could move tanks, actually. And the other one was they could be dispersed runways for the B-52s. I don't know if those stories are true or not, but I've heard both. And also as a, a trivia, I actually sat on Dwight Eisenhower's lap when I was two years old. When our family was taking a tour of the White House, my dad was a D.C. cop and he had some inside connections. Whenever we had relatives come to town, he'd always get a private tour of the White House for us. And for whatever reason, Ike himself was wandering around and being the natural born politician that he was, even though he wasn't a professional politician, he wanted to get his picture taken with this cute little two year old sitting on his lap. That was me. Wonderful. Well, don't lose that story because uh, he, you, you sat on the hero, you know, in, in, in world history, right? There's a few people that saved the world and he's one of them. But, but the interesting thing I believe, let me just correlate this to the, my odd way of thinking. So in this little town in Ohio that I'm in, it has a U.S. 40 route that is famous that goes east to west and Interstate 70 is going to emerge. And here's an example of a theory that I developed because of what happened, like using the past as a proxy, is all the best restaurants that we would go to were on US 40. The minute the interstate's open, the cars aren't leaving the interstate and therefore the food is the people that had the food elsewhere, they go out of business. But the food that comes to the interstate is not as good because all it has to do is equal access. In other words, it needs an off ramp and you need to put a fast food sign there and you're in business. But what we can witness over time is the food quality got worse. I draw that metaphor to technology and and the internet, and I'm gonna make the connection to electrification, is that the first thing, Jim, and maybe you were doing this at Thomson Reuters is, hey, we've gotta be on the internet, like, cause everybody's gotta be on it. And you didn't get judged for the quality of your experience, just that you could say you were connected. That's the same kind of dynamic. Fitness was just access. But now a better design is you got to have high quality with the access. And it's only recently in my 30 years of running businesses that the web is now being used to enhance quality. So let's take that to the charging networks. 
just as you described with your beautiful wife and you traveling, imagine the design problem is just to get access. I just don't want to be left without power. I want you to see the competitive fight will go beyond that. It'll be about access and quality. We don't know yet what else we want it to do, right? Um, I have some ideas myself that I want the charging thing to do beyond just give me power. Um, but I want, I want to point that out to you because it seems to happen in the fitness of designs of systems where the first virtue is enough to get it started, but not enough to win. Interesting. Yeah, that's a very good insight. And this would seem to be a likely place. And yeah, just to your comment about food on the road, I'm old enough to remember before the interstate weeks to drive from D.C. to my mother's hometown in northern Minnesota, mostly on back roads. And my wife and I, when we go on our road trips, almost never will we eat on one of those food places on the interstate. We'll drive into the little town and go to the little cafe if it still exists, or nowadays often a Mexican restaurant. And you're right. I mean, the comparison between the fast food sludge at the exit versus what you can find in smaller town America. And there is a really good use of the internet. When we're driving, often my wife will be driving around lunchtime. We switch off. About 1130, I'll get on Yelp and start going, all right, what looks good off the side of the road? And we found some amazing stuff. There's a little barbecue place we found in a a fairly dubious neighborhood on the outskirts of Jacksonville one time, which is still one of our legendary Yelp finds while driving by. So that is definitely a real thing. So now let's swing back towards the heart of our story and your career. And that is, I'd love to hear from you the story of the Mustang Mach-E. That was in some sense, you know, so far at least, the biggest move Ford has made. My research indicated that this was originally going to be a what was it, a Focus, electric Focus or something, right? And then your predecessor said, nah, not sexy enough, think Mustang, and take it from there. Well, you had that right, except I was the one who said that. Ah, okay. And, and I got to give credit to my, my successor, Jim Farley, that we were such collaborateurs. He's the car guy, remember? And so my successor, Jim Farley, not my predecessor, my successor and I, kind of walk into the situation, zero money being invested except for this one model. And I had um, a friend, Roger Martin, who uh, I would cite like Clayton Christensen, Jim, is a guy you have to read. Um, and Roger's, Roger's the most proliferate writer in HBR, be a great uh, candidate for your show. Um, he, Roger said that there needs to be a phrase where you say it's not good enough. He's the one who's kind of coined that. And he did a lot of work uh, with major corporations. So I, I walked in this meeting after I'd heard one of his talks and I said, I whispered to Jim Farley, I said, Jim, it's not good enough. The Focus Electric looked, Jim said this, it looked like a science project, which by the way, this isn't dissing our science friends. It means that we wanted to prove that we could electrify a car, but that's not the winning combination. And so Jim Farley is the one who says to me, uh, what if we take an established brand that has exciting qualities? And that's, that's the underpinnings. Now you need to know at Ford, this is worth saying in the archives, there's a couple other swings at this to take the Mustang success and, ex and make it extensible or adjacent. And they flame out terribly, you know, the probe. Oh, I remember the pathetic Mustang too. The Mustang II. And there was a there was even a worse concept called the Ford Probe. Oh, I remember that. That was gonna be the, the next generation Mustang, but everybody revolted and said, that piece of crap wearing the Mustang name, never. Yeah. And so there's the wisdom of the crowd if you ever needed it, right? Is that the editing that the crowd could make. So my partner, Bill Ford, I, I want to just cite for the listeners, I had such a wonderful relationship with two family companies I got to lead, Steelcase and Ford, in that I just connected with the families. And, you know, these are their businesses in large measure. And Bill and I were just really candid. And he taught me this editorial impact of Mustang owners. He said, Jim, if you start messing with that, you know, you're into, you're into a lot of uh, problems. This is when I was a kid in the fields in Ohio. You'd come back with all these uh, burrs stuck to you because you had gotten into the wrong field. 
And so I ended up, Jim, working backwards with Jim Farley and the design team. And we said, if we can take the language of Mustang and make electrics now feel very, you know, almost romantically sexy, um, there's a chance. And so Bill and I and Jim spent a lot of time looking at the iterative designs, call them the clays, you know, the little clay models. <laughs> and I'm so proud of two things with this vehicle. One is they took the language of the Mustang and interpreted it in a, in a utility. Secondly, the interior, we rethought the whole user interface versus a well-known competitor in the electrical world that you know, that uh, we felt uh, we could change the whole interface of the way the, te- the information presented itself. So, so there's a generational step function improvement in the Mustang Mach-E uh, square that you touch and, and interact with your with your vehicle. And I can talk about it now. I couldn't in the beginning because it was so new. We didn't want people to understand it before the market uh, saw it. And so that vehicle, we've sold twice what we thought we would. We had a reservation system. In your research, Jim, the automotive press has given it really rave reviews. I could actually give you quantitative answers on that because I went and read a bunch of reviews. I read five reviews. Two gave the nod to the Mach-E. Two gave the nod to the Tesla Y. All four said it was close. And Car and Driver, of course, hated the fact that you used the Mustang name, but grudgingly admitted it was a damn fine car. (laughs) You know, I'll rest in the argument because those people that are mad about that love us. So, you know, that's that, what, that's the best way. That's like my three Irish brothers, you know. I mean, they, they, that's exactly right. Uh, the audience can't see, but Jim just threw a right hook. That's exactly what what it was like. I knew they loved me as we fussed about it. But here's the, the loyalty importance, too, is I don't, you know, I don't want to over predict here. Ford will be really disciplined about deviating from what our customers tell us like that and authoring that. So the other thing I want to say is we translated this to the F-150 as well. So you haven't seen that product, but I can talk about it. There's an F-150 electric that's coming and the same same instincts are here, which we don't want to destroy the love of the F-150, number one vehicle in the world. Uh, But we've been able to capture the imagination of how you could electrify it and change the experience in a cool way. And and when I test drove it, picture this, Jim, the center of gravity gets heavier because of the battery in that thing. It drives, uh, I would say like a brand X that is a German name that begins with a P, um, you know, that that has really nice SUVs. Uh, It drives like that to me because of the way the weight changes. So I think it's going to be a huge success. Yeah, that's cool. Before we wrap up on the Mach-E, trying to get data on the internet. I actually posted a meme on Facebook the other day, which had Abraham Lincoln saying, just because you read it on Facebook doesn't mean it's true, right? But my best guess from looking at various data sources is the Mach-E, as you said, selling really well, maybe 9,000 vehicles a month, something like that. Well, we knew the press reported this. Elon's share was 81% at the end of January, and March 1st, it was 69 And it was only attributable to the Mustang Mach-E being introduced in February. My linear regression model said you guys sold 9,267 vehicles in February. Now, that was based on a bunch of assumptions on my part, but I expect it's not far off. The same analysis I did said Tesla probably sold 13,000 Ys. So remarkably close, right? And, you know, it can only go up from there. That's right. From nowhere. You know, we, I mean, I'm so proud of that story because when I walked in to the job, we did not have this vehicle designed or engineered or anything. Well, I apologize for not realizing you were the guy that said think Mustang. So, you know, good job. Actually, Jim Farley and Jim Hackett did this together. Okay, that's good. So they can, they guys can get the prize for a really interesting and ballsy pivot there. I, I mean, to say it's not good enough. I mean, I pride myself on that when my people bring me products that they think are sort of okay. And I go, what I would say, they're not sufficient for the task. And if it's not sufficient for the task, which could include style in the consumer auto business, I just say, no, nope, I'm not going to set out a product that is not sufficient for the task. And imagine the person that came back to you, this is the story, is 
Farley comes back to me and says, Mustang, if you saw my eyes, they got so big. And by the way, I had a battle because I knew that the crowd would not like it. You know, so that's why I want to take some of the uh, credit for helping getting this done, because there was a lot of resistance to even thinking about that. But Jim Farley's instincts about that platform, uh, I need to give credit there. That's great. Now, the other one I turned up in my research, I guess about to come out or just has come out, is the e-transit delivery van. Yeah. And this, again, uh, my partner, Jim and Bill, when you cited that we exited the Taurus, the Fusion, the Focus, we decided the commercial vehicle platform uh, is extraordinary important. So the transit van for Ford is one of our, after the F-150, one of our highest market share products around the world universally. And so we're really committed to this platform. In fact, there's so many exciting things coming with that platform, both in propulsion, Jim, and the intelligence of the vehicle. The intelligence, not just in, uh, we'll get to in a minute about autonomy. I'm talking about one of the things I mandated was all the vehicles had to be connected to by modem. This was not done when I walked in. And the reason to defend the people that were in charge was the cost ahead of the revenue meant that the, the product lines would show a big deficit, the cost of wiring them. But I reasoned if you didn't wire them, nothing will come. So, you know, we got to take that hit. And we got to go there. And so the e-transit will be one of the early platforms in the commercial vehicle that has both propulsion changes and new intelligence features for, for the users. And you know, I'm talking about telemetry that like uh, fleet buyers need about their vehicles, where they are, what kind of fuel efficiency they're having. Are they making all the route stops that they thought they needed? The vehicle is going to have so much intelligence, it'll integrate into the owner's business plan. I can see how that'd be hugely valuable. And of course, your evil competitor already does that kind of stuff. So you have to. Now let's pivot to real intelligence. And this is to the category of self-driving cars. One of my favorite topics and frankly, a probably be a fairly bright line in the future of humanity. As it's turned out, this has been a little harder than certain people we could name have on occasion claimed it to be. I think we probably all remember that the popular press around 2018 was trying to convince us all we'd have level five automation this year, 2021, not even close to happening. Tell me your thinking about self-driving cars, you know, sort of big picture. Well, there's a random uh, moment in my life before I go on the Ford board, just because of this curiosity uh, curse I have, like you, I can tell, is I witness either on Frontline or Nature, I can't, I know it was PBS, I think it was Frontline, is the DARPA challenge. So for the listeners, this is when the DARPA, uh, which is the research arm, you know, of the military, challenges independent collaboration from universities and companies, if the companies wanted to, to meet three or four tests for a robot to work independent of human uh, interference. And Ford uh, was one of the few companies that had its own team in the DARPA challenge. This is not well known um, because what is well known, there was a lot of people that were in that that went to work at Google, one of which ends up uh, serving our uh, startup subsidiary Argo, Brian Seleski. He's in the DARPA challenge. But one of the reasons he, he ends up partnering with us is he remembers Ford being there. So he had a lot of respect. So let's just say at the highest level, I start learning about robotics through that, that uh, frontline uh, story, which you can, the listeners can go look at. And it starts to ask a lot of questions from um, my mind to the people working on this. And I'm not on the board of Ford yet, right? We, we, we haven't gone further. As I end up in the boardroom and, of course, start to see the, the speed of this, uh, I have two things, Jim, that I have in tension. Uh, tension means in design thinking that they're, they're needed, like a guide wire needs to be on a telephone pole. And if you don't have the guide wire, then you have to make the pole, you know, a different circumference to withstand the forces of the wind. If you use the guide wire, it can, it can uh, 
be codependent. So I, I think attention is this way in design. So the technology inside the vehicle and the market development have a synchronicity that the world doesn't really understand. At the highest level, that's what I want to get across. So in other words, we could have golf carts today that are totally autonomous because the nonlinear kind of events, which means the things you don't expect that are going to happen on a, gar a golf cart path. There are things that you won't expect um, are limited so that you could program the vehicle to be super intelligent. What happens is uh, the world thinks when the first test cases of autonomy were being demonstrated that it'll just take me anywhere and I can, I can migrate from point A to point B any way I want, but the complexity rises and therefore the market uh, gets more sophisticated and there's a mismatch. So, so I drew an X, Y structure and said market sophistication and technology sophistication and drew a, a connection between the two. And, and so when I came in, I tried to dial down Wall Street's belief that both of those were at the extremes. You know, the technology sophistication, the market sophistication are such that we will have every Uber taxi be autonomous by 2021. It's just not real. And, and so resetting and being a believer, I quoted Bill Gates, who said, you tend to overestimate the arrival, underestimate the impact. I think Einstein actually said this before Bill. Um, and, and, and I think that is the issue. I'm so committed to this capability, but we have to reset what everyone believes it's going to do. And, and so uh, I'll let you go where you might in that frame. We can go down the market uh, axis or the technology axis and try and better understand it. Yeah, one thing that we could just briefly review for the listener's benefit is the five levels of automation. I have them here if you don't have them at your fingertips. No, you go ahead. That, that's on the technology axis, right? Yeah, and talk you know a little bit about what's hard about them, you know, what the market demands, etc. And then I do have a number of market questions about you know who's working with who and those sorts of things. The level zero is no automation, i.e., you know, 1965 Chevy Impala, the 327, right? And then we have driver assistance. I think my wife Subaru has adaptive cruise control, for instance, right? That slows it down, starts it up. That's not all it does. Better than nothing. And then we have you know a level two partial driver automation. Some of these cars will, you know, pass cars on the interstate, et cetera. And then we have level three, which I'm not quite sure the distinction between two and three, tell you the truth. That's one that will pass slow moving vehicles. And then four is the interesting one, and we're still not really there yet, which is it can be fully automated, no hands on in some environments, some of the time. And then level five is what we all thought, right? When we first heard about this stuff, or at least envisioned, which is anywhere, anytime, no hands. I can go to sleep in the back seat, and it can be driving through a blizzard in the Upper Peninsula, and all will be fine. That's right. When the listeners think of today, their level three is the newest kind of invention you have where you can set the cruise control and it sees the vehicle in front of it. And, and lane keep uh, so that if you start to go across the lane, that's, those are adaptive uh, systems and they're level three. And level, level two is, not, is no more a battleground. You know, everyone's penetrated that. So level three is the new battleground. And the, the interesting question about going from three to four is the role of the driver. And, and so, and you, you know, I have a, 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 an intellectual friend, uh, Dan Ariely, a behavioral economist that I really love. And he talks about the psychology of people owning their vehicles. So this is independent of your scale, Jim, you just described, SAE scale. It's the, what's at the core of human motivation. So people signal through their ownership a bunch of things about owning their vehicle. In fact, you have to say, what, what asset do you have in your life that's 90% of the time in dwell and you're willing to borrow money, you know, to pay for it? And automotive is the trick answer. It's because it means so much. And guess what happened in the pandemic? It the demand went way back up again because when people were threatened with their independence, the vehicle gave them more control. And so I want to start with that and say to you that the passage from three to four, I think, is definitely going to happen. It's just 
the human role in that is not unlike what you will remember from the PC business. When, when the computer science and computer engineering was so far ahead of what we understood about its use, and then as we understood more about its use, we start to see a separation of the winners because they start to put the emphasis on investment about what people care most about, you know, about their computer. And we would have, you and I comparing notes back in the day, I knew the Xerox Park teams, they were some of the earliest people talking about the dynamic of use. And it, you know, it finds its way into Apple's designs, it finds its way into steel case designs and some of the thinking. Mark Weiser was the father of ubiquity. Um, he, his, his notions uh, really uh, have transcended modern times. But before that, it was, it was just how does a computer work and the speed in which it works? And we don't get nearly the adoption until we have the user breakthrough. So I'm, I'm just forecasting for you this similar rubric is for the, the power of vehicle intelligence, is, is that the minute it starts saving lives, the minute it starts to do things that you don't like doing, it's going to get higher acceptance. And I can talk more about that. Yeah, it's interesting as I read about what's on offer from some of the high end car guys, you know, there's a, I think one of the top Cadillacs sounds like it's sort of level four ish, but you have to have your hands on the steering wheel and your eyes looking at the road. And I go, why would I want to do that? Right. If I have to sit there and pay attention and have my hands near at hand, and I'd rather have a manual shifter at a hot rod, right? Give me a Mustang Shelby 350 or something like that. So that one doesn't appeal to me, but maybe it would appeal to some people. So I think, you know, defining where it appeals to people will be very interesting. And safety might be one. You know, when people originally said, oh, a fully automated car, it's impossible. How could they ever make it safe enough? And I said, well, if they had to make it perfectly safe, yes, it'd be damn hard. But they only have to make it safer than humans. But on the other hand, humans are pretty good. It's, what is it, about one fatality per 100 million miles driven, which is pretty remarkable for humans. When last I looked, it was a year and a half ago, it was 32,000 deaths from vehicles. There's 55,000 deaths when you add bicycles and motorcycles and pedestrians getting hit by those. These are all things that we got to get down to nil, right, to zero. And, and, and then as we're recording this podcast today, it's just the weekend before where Tesla has this terrible crash down in spring texas where this is factual where the police have found that there was a person in the back and a person in the passenger seat and no driver oh dear shouldn't be doing that yeah and and it was tragic you know they both die in a terrible fire and and so that's that just answers your question between three and four see is the role of the driver is the argumentative part now let's just take a moment and say well then why not just jump to four and the way I've explained this to people that don't have your background, Jim, in science is what I mean by nonlinear events. So imagine we have a smart vehicle and we're, the way they make these is there's programmers inside the car when it's driving itself. They have computers mirroring everything the car is seen real time. And at the end of the night, when there's mistakes, they're editing the program and editing the software. So imagine this vehicle approaches a baseball. They get home at night and they go back and they go, anytime there's a baseball on the street, there may be a child. So you need to slow down. The next day, imagine it approaches a mitten and the same, you know, it says see rule number one, you know, about the baseball. The third day, it sees a leaf and it stops. What happened then is we got autonomy working, but it doesn't totally understand the difference between a leaf and a mitten and a baseball. So that's what to explain to the world why it takes so much money and so much time. And, and then because you understand complexity, there's no way to program what Murray Gelman said is all the non-regularities. You know, these are the things that don't repeat themselves, but when they do happen, they, they're changing the balance and dynamic of things. So the way you fix this uh, if you listen to Brian Selesky on his podcast called No Parking, um, he talks about that the vehicle can have enough intelligence to, as it gets near things that it makes itself more tentative so that it doesn't rush into 
uh, one of those classic uh, cases of you're going to either hit a, a mother in a baby carriage or run into a big bus. It's not going to it's not going to focus itself in a moral dilemma. It's just not going to let itself get there. That's an example of a rule set then that makes it possible to have the role of the driver or driver less clear. And that's what's taking the time. But I have a lot of faith that that will make it so that'll make it uh, so that we'll have autonomy. Yeah. And the VC guy I had on, we talked a fair amount about not only being able to do it on the road, but more and more of this incremental finding the corner cases is being done in very high resolution simulations. In fact, that in quantum computing is the way we'll conquer this, right? Because we can do 3 billion miles of usage now in the simulations. And we're doing that. Google was doing that. And it is the way the way this will work. But I, but I, want, I want the audience to understand, and I, I got to think it's not I'm trying to be careful, I'm trying to be clear, is I think it'd be wiser if we look at the way computing evolved is to match the market sophistication. So in other words, let's just, let's imagine we're in a block in New York that's really heavily traveled. We can use autonomous vehicle to make both right and left turns to understand traffic and go in that square a thousand times a day. And, and be highly reliable. It probably won't be as fast as a human because it won't take the risks that humans will, but it'll be really reliable. And it'll start to disrupt mass transit, I think, really cost effectively. Um, that's an example of early applications that you're going to start to see of autonomous vehicles. I believe there's already someone that's deployed a shuttle that runs from, I think it's, the, is it the Las Vegas airport to some hotels? And because it's a known route, you can cut out a lot of the corner cases. Not them all, but they actually have it in production and have had it for some time. So as we know from our complexity perspective, we're talking about ultra high dimensional phase spaces here. When we talk about all possible driving under all possible conditions in all possible locations, this is just a gigantic high dimensional search space that you can never get 100% correct, but can you get it better than humans is the question. While driving from Las Vegas airport to one of the hotels on the Strip, much lower dimensionality in the problem, so you don't have to be as smart to solve it. Or what I'd like to say, I do, I totally accept your condition of better than humans, but let's just say for the market it's supposed to operate in. So let me, let me give you an example. You and I get on jetliners all the time and totally trust them. There was a day when that wasn't so, right? And so the market for going to China, you know, only came because we could now trust the, the plane would not die, you know, itself and kill people over an ocean where there was no way to recover. You know, that's, that's, that's the um, kind of 66 year old uh, wisdom that I will pass to everyone about autonomy is that let the markets progress at pace with the technology versus the other way around. Because if we start to push the edges of safety, we will lose the trust of the market. And, that, and that's really hard to, to rebirth just by saying, oh, we didn't, don't worry about flying. You know, you saw that crash, but it's better than Six Sigma. They still don't believe you. I mean, witness what we had to deal with trying to convince everyone to get a vaccine, right? And when, when the answer about how relatively safe it is, you still have people going, I don't want to take the probability that I might die. And, and so I'm, this is, I'm not meaning to suggest that this is different, or excuse me, not different from those. I think it's as heightened as those. Uh, we, ought to, we have to be that careful about this instrument. Uh, we cannot be careless. Yep. I think that's certainly the Uber fiasco down in Arizona underscored that, right? That really put the whole field back a ways. Though on the flip side, you talk about aviation. Aviation used to be damn dangerous, right? Even in the 70s, planes didn't look much different than they did now. You know, a 727 kind of looks like a 767. Obviously, they're much more sophisticated now. But in those days, they were fairly dangerous. Not as dangerous as cars, but still somewhat dangerous. Now they're amazingly safe. But people were flying even in the 50s. Yeah, and, and, and they pilot air or weather, you know, in, in other words, the, the, the echo environment was challenging the dynamics of the airplane. Now their sensing systems of flying uh, is, is, you know, every accident, you know this, they update the quality. But for Ford, Ford's got its brand on this vehicle, and I know what's at the heart of Bill Ford's 
content of conscience and the care that he has for all of his customers. We just we we are going to match the safety with the expectations of our customers. That's that's where we're starting. Sounds smart. Are you willing to talk about the various players in the space? Waymo versus Cruise versus Argo, etc. Do you have thoughts about the various players and how this thing is starting to set up? Well, I I have this observation where we started on, you know, the number of vehicles that Henry Ford competed against car companies or the Chinese today in electric is there's more than will survive is what I would say to you. In fact, there's already been a bit of a shakeout. Jim, if you go back when I left the board and started as chairman of Smart Mobility, there was a lot more investment flowing in than there is today. Um, and every one of them uh, that you mentioned are now the highly regarded ones that are left. I think that I'm proud of the facts that VW wanted to align itself with one of the providers in that group that you just mentioned and evaluated, I think all of them, I don't want to speak for VW, but they picked Argo. And so I think that was a good test because VW at one level is makes the most vehicles in the world at one time. And the work that was started here was ahead of where they were internally. And so that's why there's co-opetition there. I'd also make the observation to you by, and I don't think this will be inflammatory for any of the competitors, is to remember what happened in the computer industry again. But I'll say it a different way this time, is that when we first started, when I was in, I'm you know going back 40 years when I started in business, and I remember the first PC delivered in the company I was at, and it had a DOS operating system And I went in on a Sunday trying to run it myself. You know, I hadn't been trained in programming, but I thought I might like to toy with this. There was no way I could read the manual and use it. Now, let's go to my granddaughter, who's just 22 months, just, you know, the apple of my eye of four granddaughters, the one that's the youngest. She can run her iPad today with no instruction. So that we just got to witness what happened in the computing science along with interface design. That's why I'm such a big proponent in my background around design thinking. It changes the accessibility to the quality. That's what, that's what I wanted to use with the restaurant metaphor. Now, if we look at the competitors, I do not think any of one of them have distinguished themselves at the quality level that I think is going to be needed yet. And so that's my forecast is that all of them could be at peril if they don't if they don't see that challenge, you know, that they have to understand the way use is the is the is the mediator of who wins. The use design is the mediator. Interesting. Now, I did find one data point as I was digging around in this stuff which is the California statistics, which they publish regularly. Most recent data set, one of the key numbers is how often does the AI have to disengage and just give up? And that's considered one of the figures of merit. And currently the two leaders are Waymo and Cruz. In the most recent quarter, they disengaged once every 30,000 miles on average. Argo was at 10,000 and most of the other ones were down around 1,000, some of them even less. So that's not designed, though, to your point. This is sort of raw technological performance. Well, and you'll you'll be troubled as a scientist about something in that study. So Argo actually has the harder markets. Like we're in Miami, you know, which is what we call a black diamond market, like a black diamond ski slope. We're in Washington, D.C. The markets where we're testing, we would love to be in Phoenix, um, you know, where the w- roads are wide and you know, no snow. yeah, no snow. And so, no, we took on the harder edge. And so we, we don't put a lot of, in fact, Brian Selesky, the founder and CEO of Argo is kind of outspoken about this, that we need to get a standard different than that because there's no context of the complexity of the system that the vehicle is operating in with that statistic. So we, we think we're probably, we, we have data, we look at it every day. We think we're probably doing much better than third. Interesting. And that's, of course, a very legitimate argument. It's, you know, it's the apples and oranges comparison, right? You know, if you were doing Pittsburgh, which Uber was doing, 
A good friend of mine lives in Pittsburgh. We get up there fairly frequently. And for a while there, he saw these Uber self-driving cars all the time. And Pittsburgh is a double black diamond, let me tell you. There are no square streets because it's a triangle, lots of hills, lots of weird bridges, a lot of really crappy roads, and the weather sucks. So they were on the double black diamond. That's very different than Mesa, Arizona, where you know Waymo is doing its thing. Well, and Argo's headquartered in Pittsburgh, Jim, so that's where we have the most vehicles deployed. We've been there the longest, and, and, I, and, you, and you characterized it perfectly. So, you know, but let's, let's agree that that, for you as someone who is, you know, kind of coursing over the science of autonomy, you go, hey, Jim Hackett, I'd like to figure out how, how reliable is this system, you know? That, that's a really important need. And, and so there has, there's going to have to be a transparency about its intelligence. You know, how intelligent should it be? And I will return you to my matrix. For its market, it's got to do these things, you know. So, you know, the, uh, the airplanes had to meet a standard of being within two hours of a coastline for a long time when they went overseas. And then they, they've been able to relieve that pressure because the technology of the engines got so sophisticated. That's an example of the market and the technology being aligned in history that you're going to find in autonomy the same way. Interesting. I just had an idea. And one of the things I like about my show is sometimes I'll have an idea, right? Which is, hmm, wouldn't it be interesting if, let's say, the transportation department mandated that all autonomous cars have infrastructure hooks such that their AIs can all run in the same simulated environment so that there was indeed an apple and apple comparison. And you could have red teams at the Department of Transportation that could build really tough courses and change them every time, right? But have all the vendors run the same portfolio of courses and see how they did. That could be really valuable for the world as sort of a forcing function to make them get better and, and then say, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right? We all know marketing guys. They go, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if we had here something that really was objective, it might actually help the whole industry sort out what it is and what it's doing and make everybody better. Yeah, and I'm a, I'd be a fan of that too. We, we touched lightly on it. You're going to probably need quantum level computing because the optimization problem is so damn complex. But we ain't going to have quantum computing on cars anytime soon. That's another area I follow. I meant in, for the testers, for the simulation. Yeah, we take the data from the vehicle and put it through the processing of quantum computing. I think that would give you what you want. Yeah, though, though unfortunately, that's fairly years away. Before we leave the marketplace, do you have any opinion about what Apple is up to? The potential trillion dollar question. Well, I think the world misunderstands what they really are doing. Um, I have to be careful because I have some insights. And what I would say, you remember I left you with this riddle about who understands use has an advantage, you know, in the future of the machine market dynamic. So that's, that's a plug for Apple's capability, right? They, 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 they're very thoughtful people to understand uh, those kinds of applications. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I have the utmost respect for them. There's a quick anecdote for you, Jim. So when I'm running Steelcase, I, uh, I, I, I experience an extraordinary uh, talent in David Kelly, who founded a company called IDEO. And because Steelcase was private at the time and IDEO was private, um, we acquired IDEO. And so David and I worked side by side for 20 years when I was running Steelcase. He's now the father of the design program at Stanford. And, and Steve Jobs was his best man in his wedding. So I got to stand on the shoulders of these giants when I was very young, watching uh, Steve and David transform products and processes and companies using this technique called design thinking, what IDEO had mastery of. And this is why you hear it coming through my pores when I'm talking about complex problems. And so that I have this innate uh, sense that Steve Jobs wasn't just lucky. You know, he actually had he had a special a special skill, you know, like magical. And, and, and I have a friend, my best friend probably is David Kelly, 
who doesn't get enough credit for actually being behind as much of that in parallel. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I'm devoted to uh, the continuation of that impact in business is what I would say. And so I'd love to see it applied to autonomy. So you didn't quite answer the question, but it basically I'll answer for you. You can wave your fist at me if I'm too far off, which is that if Apple actually is doing something in a serious way, they could be a damn serious competitor because they're way up on the curve with respect to understanding human factors and design and design in a very deep and rich sense that Ivy and Jobs and those guys and David Kelly perfected. And I'll just mention in passing, I was very impressed. I did not know this at all. But when I was doing the research for the show, I saw that you guys had bought IDEO. I had no idea. And that's, of course, one of the great companies in the world, right, in what they do. And so that was a very very clever move for a furniture company in Grand Rapids to go buy IDEO. Holy shit, right? Quite amazing. Yeah. You know, at the underpinning is, you know, how do you talk about your best friend? You get emotional. This is a guy who changed my life. And uh, we've, we've lived together now for a long time in business. As I went to Ford, of course, we didn't, Ford didn't own IDEO, but, but he was quite helpful in helping me build a capability at Ford that's there as I left that's able to do some of this. So I want to leave you with uh, not a fist because I think you're, you said it respectfully is in parallel in the systems design, the vehicle construction and the engineering of vehicles is equally problematic in the science-based way. And, and what I came away with, I fell in love with Ford is the quality here is at the highest level. In fact, David, who's an electrical engineer tenured at Stanford, said to me once, the mechanical engineering at University of Michigan might be the best in the world. Well, that's because of the automotive companies that surround Ann Arbor, right? So if you saw the world in the future as an integration of software, uh, mechanical engineering, um, and what I'm calling design thinking, uh, it's anybody's bet who can do the best integration of that. The one being better than the other doesn't guarantee that it'll win. So what of course, you're now finding my secret that I tried to make the point at Ford. You can't be weak in one of these areas and expect to compete with the likes of Apple. So that that's where I would endorse what you said. Okay. Yeah, very diplomatic. And that was good. Second to last question. Part of your charter at the Ford Mobility Unit was to consider transportation as a service. And we've heard big car companies, the Detroit car companies kind of go back and forth on that. It was one point that General Motors sounded like it was going to spend all of its money to go after Uber. And then I haven't heard that much about that lately. Where do you think transportation as a service fits relative to the individually owned automobile in the years ahead? Well, you think I was diplomatic on the last one. Let me, this one I'm going to try and outdo because I don't want to put words in Bill Ford and Jim Farley's mouths, you know, because they are, they are the people in charge. And I love these two men, you know, I'm very close to them. But I can tell you Jim Hackett's philosophy about this in a way that, that gives them what they need uh, in their independence. Jim, Jim Hackett's philosophy is, in business, when you have a vessel, meaning uh, it's going to yield like, or I don't want to say golden goose, let's say a vessel that's going to yield all the kind of um, value that you want to you want to get out of it. My principle was I don't want my eyes to get distracted by other vessels that would be nice to plant idea, ideas in, but I'm now going to get distracted by. So that's a hint for you that I think the vessel of product and systems development and intelligence of the vehicle and the applications that come from it are just so fruitful in the future. We haven't talked about the, you know, the ability for you, Jim, to pull up to your garage and you don't need a garage door opener in the future because the vehicle and the house are having what I call smart vehicle and smart world are now intersecting. And I've coined that phrase inside the company to say all the applications are going to change. Like you used to, you followed a generation of engineers said, we've got to put a door opener in your car so you don't have to get out and open the garage door. That was a step function improvement from get. But now there's another one. We don't have to have that. And how much value is that? There's a trillion ideas like that, given the intelligence of the vehicle and the intelligence of the edge. And that's what I would say to all the VCs and investors in the Wall Street following the Ford 
it's un, it's unbridled in terms of its potential. So you take an idea like transportation as service. I don't want to talk them out of the potential of that because there are a lot of people that believe people want to give up their cars and they just want to share a system. I was not one who believed in that as much. Um, and I've, I've been proven a little right given the losses that you're seeing in those, they're called task models. Uber's lost $600 billion. You know, um, now, is there a tipping point like Amazon where it, it, it suddenly starts to be, you know, its utility is high enough? I, I don't know. I'm not going to talk against them. I think, you know, I'd love for them to buy lots of Ford cars. But I think we ought to stick to the, to the vessel that I just talked to you about. That's an opinion from a retired automotive executive. Okay, I see clearly where you're coming from, which was to stick to your knitting, but because this particular knitting basket's got plenty of wool in it for the time being. Perfect. Better said by Northern Minnesota. <laughs> uh, last question, and this is kind of, I don't know what this question's about, but it's uh, sort of ba based on data, which is we have Ford, we have General Motors, we got Toyota, we got VW. Between them, they make a fair percentage of all the world's cars. You add up their stock market market cap, and it's less than one company in Fremont, California. What's all that about? Well, this is the the little bit of you know in a technical way, it means the terminal value of Ford by the investors mean it'll never make more money than it does today. You know, forty five billion is the market cap. I think it was making like seven or eight billion a year. So that's saying. Even at a 10% hurdle rate, as you say, it's all downhill from here is what they're betting. What they're betting. And th that's the Kodak question, right? You know, is this company seen its best days? But you just heard me make the argument the other way with the Vestal notion. It's because you have the psychological connection with people and their vehicles. And because you now have data coming, Jim, in three years, in different podcasts, I'm using different time sets for different reasons, but let's say two to three years, that we'll have a hundred million years worth of data from the F-150, which, which to the listeners means it would have taken us a hundred million years to get the data that's now being acquired because of all the connectivity. We will have more vehicles connected than the Fremont California company has in total. It's because we produce a million of these a year, right? So in two years, we have 2 million vehicles. You know, uh, in three years, we have 3 million, you know, if, if the sales. So think we'll have 5 million vehicles all connected by year five. We just finished our second year. That's where I get this data. And so there's just no way in math that Ford's not here in the future, given what that data stream can mean to the investors in the company. Now it's incumbent on us, meaning like when I was in charge, to prove we can commercialize that and we can rapidly deploy. But I'll, I'll give you a quick, quick story. I have an F-150 hybrid. It's the brand new one. It's the one that's being hard to get delivered now because of the chip shortage. We're working really hard on that. The whole industry is affected by it. It's, it's my favorite Ford I've ever driven. It's just that much better, right? And they called me from Dearborn. I'm in West Michigan now. And they said, hey, can you bring the truck back? And I said, why? And they go, well, we found something. So they found in the data streams a, you know, an, a, a, a derivative problem that, that has not become a problem that that they were investigating. That's why we, some of us, it isn't because of position, we get vehicles early. It's because they want us testing them, you know, early. And, and I'm so proud of this because I mandated the connectivity that I got an engineer to call me and say, I want your vehicle back. We're going to be able to do that with our customers and fix them over the air. And so how can that not be value creation for investors in Ford Motor Company? But we have to prove that we do that. So what used to take six months to get to that engineer's desk, literally, they got in less than two hours uh, from the example I just gave you. So I hope I make you make the case because you're you're an entrepreneur at heart. You you start to your ideas are like this. You think, give me the data, give me the platform, give me a well-known brand like Ford. 
boy, there's a future there. And that's why I loved the 41 months I got to run the company. I wish I had been younger because that, that's no replacement. Don't we all, right? Don't we all? <laughs> well, and, you know, given this challenge, because when I was asked to step in, you know, I wasn't sure whether it was a year or two years or three years, but it turned out to be 41 months. And so the heartburn I've had leaving is that the opportunity is so high but I'm really proud of the team that's there and they get what I just said to you. They really get it. Very good. Well, Jim Hackett, I want to thank you for one of my favorite episodes. This has been just a wonderful conversation. I've learned a tremendous amount and I've learned about a guy who I, man, I really respect how he plays the game of business. So thanks to Jim Hackett for being on the Jim Rutt Show. Thank you, Jim. And I, I, I'll never forget when we met at Santa Fe and it's so nice to have you return and have us talk. So please keep me in your list of interesting uh, people we both want to meet because I love all the, the things that you're doing on your podcast. I really appreciate it. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.